This morning we would open our Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 23 and in the middle of this chapter verses 12 through verse 17 of 2 Samuel chapter 23. And I pray that the Lord will bless us this morning to open the Scriptures. If I'm able to preach that that's upon my mind this morning, I'd preach to you upon the subject matter of spiritual water. For the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, the lessons in the Scripture concerning spiritual water and what that which water represents, we, we understand natural water, there's spiritual water. There's to discern spiritual water. The spirit is symbolized as water. And so the scripture teaches us concerning this in many places, but I'm turned here this morning to bring to you a natural happenstance, a narrative in a natural setting, but to see also if we could get a spiritual interpretation, a spiritual application to set forth to speak upon uh, water in the sense of symbolical or in a metaphor or allegory way of teaching of the Lord's refreshing and the Lord's supply to His obedient people. And I believe His his obedient people are disciples. Certainly disciples would be obedient people. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 23, this chapter begins with what we understand and... uh, I don't know of any primitive Baptist that don't use and understand the first verses, particularly verses uh, 1 through 5, in dealing here in 2 Samuel chapter 23 and setting forth the everlasting covenant of grace. But then it turns, the narrative does, the scriptures turn from dealing with that subject matter of dealing uh, there those first five verses with, uh, of course, David, the son of Jesse, but more so David, the son of God. And the son of God, uh, more more reference here, the son of David, uh, the son of God, David in that sense. But here then in the next verses down through uh, verse 11 and verse 12, there, you have the mention of three mighty men of David. And of course, then in the remainder part of this chapter, the scripture teaches us here about uh, 30 uh, of the mighty men of David. These verses, this, this chapter, is more so over in the latter years of David's life, not the last one or two, I don't believe, But in the latter years of David's life, David continuously battled with the Philistines. That was a continuous and ongoing. The Philistines were uh, foes of of Israel. They were consistent. If if anything you could say, the Philistines were were consistent uh, uh, in being a foe and being an enemy against Israel. And so here we have in verse 12, as it begins, uh, concerning one of these three, that he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief went down. Three of the thirty chief, the chief of David's mighty men, went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephraim. 
Is that familiar? <laughs> that valley of Rephraim? Uh, here we are once again there in the valley of Ref Rephraim. And of course, as you remember, that was uh, a valley there that, that went up uh, to Jerusalem uh, about four and a half miles or so southwest of Jerusalem and in the vicinity of Bethlehem. That's very important also. And the scripture tells us in, in verse 14, And David was then in an hold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said. Now here we are. Notice this now. Uh, David uh, is kind of cut off. He's, he's in a place. He's in between this valley of Rephraim, in between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Uh, David's in a, in a holt. Uh, he, he's in a pinned down place. Uh, uh, no one of his folks are coming and going. They're kindly in a stay, if you please. And David makes this statement then. Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So here David is longing. He has a thirst, but he longs to drink out of that well. I don't know that David was uh, so desperate and, and dire uh, for water from that standpoint, but I believe it was more in a context. Uh, this was area that David was familiar with. David was from this particular area. He was from Bethlehem. The scripture uh, teaches us uh, of, of the lineage, uh, of the uh, nativity. Uh, this, of course, was where the, the king uh, sent, told them to go back to pay their taxes. And, and of course, Mary and Joseph went to, back to Bethlehem because uh, uh, Joseph and Mary was of, the, of the, the city of David, the tribe of Judah. And remember what Micah 5 and 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that shall be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And of course that's reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And of course this was that area that David was from. And no doubt David grew up around that area. David brought the flocks uh, uh, of Jesse in and out uh, among that area. And no doubt he had drunk from that well uh, many a time. He had drunk from the well that was by the gate uh, uh, there at Bethlehem. And now he is pinned down. He is in a hold. You know, a lot of times, folks, uh, you know, when we, when we grow older, uh, uh, a lot of times we have desires to, to go back uh, uh, and, and see places uh, and, and to visit landmarks uh, and uh, to, to see some of the, uh, those places uh, of experiences that we had in younger days and in young adult uh, uh, hood. You know, it's always good to go back to the old home place or where the old home place was. Uh, uh, maybe to see a flower uh, blooming there. Uh, flowers, uh, you know, that had uh, survived uh, for decades and, and, and were the scents of flowers that were there before. Maybe that was all that was left there in that place around an oak tree with buttercups uh, uh, that still come up from bugs uh, uh, many, many years ago and so forth and, and maybe there was a well there or a stream or a little creek uh, you know that's where folks build homesteads by uh, years ago you know water is a vital element uh, uh, water is that which we must have uh, and we know the settlers uh, uh, back before water came in pipes and you had plumbing and so forth uh, uh, back before city water and county water uh, and, and back before there was uh, uh, even so many wells that were dug uh, uh, the settlers uh, uh, they uh, settled along streams and creeks and places where there was good sweet water 
where there was cold water. I've heard my granddad talk about it many a time uh, of how that they would uh, have the, uh, the milk in containers uh, and put it down in the brook or in the stream to keep it cold uh, uh, and so forth because uh, they, they didn't have the other things. They didn't have uh, ice. Uh, they didn't have electricity uh, back then over a hundred years ago. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, individuals uh, would would settle along places where there was water supplies and, and, and where they could get to water, where there was good water. Water is essential. Yeah. And so this well at Bethlehem, it was much used. We, we hear, read in the Old Testament a lot of times about the wells and the drawing from the wells. And, and was it not Rebecca uh, that was drawing uh, from the well uh, and, and gave unto uh, O Eleazar, Abraham's servant, water and, and offered to, to water the animals and did water the animals and so forth? Uh, uh, wasn't it Moses uh, uh, when he came upon uh, the place uh, and, and the daughters uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, the priest of Midian there? Uh, what were they doing? They were drawing water uh, out of the well. Uh, so we see and understand many places we could talk about uh, uh, folks that were uh, getting water for the necessities of this life. Uh, just as uh, the necessity of natural water, that, brothers and sisters, there's the necessity of the spiritual water, uh, amen, in our lives. Uh, and Jesus Christ personified, uh, amen, is the supplier uh, of uh, our spiritual water, our spiritual drink. Uh, I tell you that the gospel uh, and the preaching of the gospel and sitting on the sound of the gospel, uh, amen, is drinking uh, a spiritual water water uh, when the good Lord uh, blesses it uh, in that way. I read in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 25 that says as cold waters to a thirsty soul so is good news from a far country. Uh, just like uh, when in the summertime you're, you're, you get hot and, and you get thirsty, you deplete uh, the, the water, uh, you deplete uh, the moisture in your body. Our bodies is made up a large percentage uh, of water, of liquid, and we have to take it in. And when we perspire and, and sweat uh, and so forth, we have to replenish that. We get really thirsty. And one reason we get so thirsty and get to craving after the water is because we've had water before. And our body knows what it is and knows uh, that we need it and need to take it in. You know, a lot of times in the winter time, uh, when it's not so hot and so forth, sometimes maybe you have to remind yourself uh, uh, to take in some sufficient amounts of fluid uh, and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but when it's hot and when you're engaged uh, in the heat and under the sun, uh, uh, you don't have to remind yourself too much. Your body uh, will begin to crave for water and thirst uh, and, you, and you feel the need and the sense uh, uh, for that water and so it is as cold waters to a thirsty soul so it's good news from a far country I tell you brothers and sisters that the, the gospel amen it is good news from a far country it is good news to our spiritual being uh, to our spiritual man that new creation created uh, amen by the creative voice of the son of God uh, in regeneration uh, oh uh, we need to drink uh, we need uh, to have that supply uh, of, of the spiritual water uh, that will quench uh, our spiritual thirst and in it only can quench uh, our spiritual thirst. So on this occasion, David said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And seeing this hold in this situation, he desired one more time to drink water from that well. Now it was natural, natural water. But now... Notice this, verse 16 of 2 Samuel 23 says, 
and the three mighty men break through the host. And I believe it's the three that had been mentioned in those earlier verses. But they broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. David desired that water. These three mighty men, they, they knew that their king, they were loyal to him. They were loyal subjects, and they break through. Uh, the Bible tells us uh, uh, that they broke through uh, the host of the Philistines, and they drew the water out of the well and they took it and they brought it to David but when they did David would not drink it but he poured it out unto the Lord he poured it out as a drink offering now you'll read about many places in the scriptures about drink offerings at the feast of tabernacles in which that coincides with John chapter 7 there was a lot of drawing and pouring out of water and of course, it water representing the Spirit. And Jesus used it on that day in John chapter 7. Amen. In that relationship of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the outpouring uh, of the Spirit of God. So David poured this water out. He wouldn't drink this water, even though it had sentimental value. Uh, like I said, I don't know how thirsty that he was. Uh, or how much out of a, from, a, from an emotional or, or sentimental uh, stance uh, he desired to, walk, to drink water once again uh, out of that familiar well. <laughs> Praise God, there is a familiar well uh, unto God's people that have heard the joyful sound. And happy is the people of God that know the joyful sound and know the gospel and the true ringing and the blowing of the silver trumpet. Amen. Of the gospel of Christ and telling of our Lord and of Him high and lifted up. Amen. And that He is our source. He is the one that quenches our thirst and also that feeds our hungry soul. You know, Jesus taught in an allegory uh, also uh, in, in using symbolic language uh, of drinking his blood and eating his flesh. Uh, many of the folks, uh, well, most of them thought of it in a natural sense. Jesus wasn't taught about it in a natural sense. Uh, uh, Jesus was speaking of it from a sense uh, of discipleship and devotion to him. Uh, amen. Uh, that you drink my blood, uh, that you eat my flesh. Amen. That you have a close relationship with me. That you walk in my ways. That you adhere to my words. Oh, uh, in the same sense of the Lord as we talked about uh, that Laodicea church when he said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold uh, tried in the fire. Not with uh, natural gold. Not uh, uh, with money. Uh, but uh, uh, with service. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, relationship lives and dependence and throwing ourselves upon our blessed Lord and our blessed Savior. Oh, and eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. He wasn't teaching cannibalism. Uh, no, this was a spiritual lesson. Uh, this was uh, a symbolic type language. Uh, but it was getting to the very root and to the very heart of discipleship. And so it's David. Uh, he, he goes on in verse 17 and he gives the reason uh, here that he poured it out. Notice what he said. And he said, talking about David, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Oh, that I should drink this water that they break through, that they uh, hazard their lives. They hazard their lives. They put their lives at risk to go get David a drink of water. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, not only did the Lord Jesus Christ uh, put himself and hazard himself uh, uh, at the risk of losing his life, I want to tell you, he laid down his life. Amen. For his people, he laid down his life. 
life. Amen. Also for his disciples and those that would eat his flesh and drink his blood. Now he laid down his life for all the elect. Amen. Oh, but I want to tell you, he went farther than these three mighty men. Oh, he gave himself that his people could drink of him and that we could have the gospel blessing. You know, the Lord Jesus accomplished two things coming to this earth. He accomplished a lot of things, and he did a lot of things here on the shores of time. Amen. But the, I, would, I would rank first and foremost, he saved his people from their sins. <laughs> Amen. First and foremost, that's the entire elect family of God. But then I think the, the next thing was, amen, that he built, amen, a gospel church. Amen, a gospel kingdom here in this earth. Amen, which is at the hub, which is at the center, amen, of his overall kingdom. I've said it like this many a times, that the gospel church is the capital city, amen, of the empire, of the kingdom, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the gospel church, the true church of Jesus Christ, is where he is acknowledged and most praised for exactly who he is and what he has done. Yeah. Oh, yes. Amen. But he not only hazarded his life, but he gave his life yeah. for his disciples to drink of him. Yeah. Amen. To drink his blood and eat his flesh. Amen. To walk with him and to have fellowship with him and to have a well. Amen. Of water here in this life. To have a water supply and to sit under the sound of the gospel. And it be as good news from a far country. Amen. A refreshing to our soul. Oh, uh, whereby our thirst is quenched. We are uh, in the heat of a spiritual battle. Uh, just like the natural body uh, gets uh, thirsty under the toll and under the heat of the natural. Uh, so as we engage in spiritual warfare, as we engage in the heat uh, in a spiritual sense, of the battle of the day and as we are uh, pressing uh, as we are doing uh, warfare uh, even against uh, the flesh and the world and the devil uh, uh, we get thirsty uh, and uh, Christ is our water uh, oh uh, thank God uh, uh, there is abundance of supply uh, of refreshment from our blessed Lord uh, and uh, uh, this great supply uh, oh uh, comes uh, unto us uh, uh, through different avenues but the main uh, source uh, and supply of this uh, I believe uh, is in the house of the Lord under the sound of the gospel whereby we have uh, amen the refreshment that comes down uh, uh, that comes from the presence of the Lord so he said be it far from me O Lord that I should do this is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? In other words, he symbolized that water even as their blood. Notice that. Uh, because they went in jeopardy of their lives. They could have been killed. Uh, breaking through the Philistines. Breaking through that hold and going and drawing water out of that well to get David a drink of that water. Oh, they risked their lives uh, David wouldn't drink it then after that. But he poured it out as a drink offering unto the Lord. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. These three mighty men that went and drew this water. Brought it to David. He poured it out because he, he thought of it even as blood. Because of the jeopardy of them hazarding their lives. And their lives, their blood could have been uh, spilled. The shedding of blood which is the killing and, uh, and which is death. And even so though the Lord Jesus Christ didn't just hazard his life or put his life in jeopardy. Amen. But he gave himself. Did the Lord not tell his disciples in that upper room uh, when he instituted his supper? He said, this cup, he, he said that it is the blood of the New Testament. Amen. It is the token of it. Take and drink ye all of it. Amen. They were to take it and to drink it. That wine represented the blood 
of Jesus Christ. He said, this, talking of that blood, he said, which is shed for many. <laughs> Amen. How many? All that the Father gave him. Uh, that's exactly how many. He said that's how many he would give eternal life to, as many as the Father gave him. And that's how many he shed his life for. Not one more, not one less. There won't be one in hell that Jesus uh, uh, shed his blood for. Amen. amen. I'll amen that. Amen. Thank God forevermore. Bless his sweet and holy name. I want to turn over. You know, David, he was, the scripture referred to him in one place. Now David was, he was just a man. And David had faults and failures and, and David committed great sin. But you know, one place the scripture teaches us though that David was a man after God's own heart. David had a, a great relationship with God. He had a great yearning after God. And in Psalm 42... I, I love these words uh, that are pinned down as the heart, talking about the deer, as the deer, the heart, the deer painteth after the water brooks, so painteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Oh, notice this expression. Notice these words. Thirsting after God. Oh, uh, remember there in Psalm 84, the lesson uh, where, where he talked about uh, how great a yearning for the, for the uh, lovely tabernacles uh, of God uh, David did. And uh, to go once again to the tabernacles uh, and to see the Lord and to see the religious uh, worship and the religious exercise going on uh, around uh, the court, the different courts of the tabernacle uh, of the Lord uh, and, and how the scripture brings it out and it encompassed uh, uh, body, uh, soul, and spirit. Uh, the soul and the spirit uh, and it had such charge uh, that it was even having an effect upon the body. Uh, oh, brothers and sisters, that we would walk in the spirit and live in the spirit, uh, that it would have an effect even upon our bodies, uh, that we'd be able to bring our members under subjection, uh, oh, that we'd be able to glorify God uh, in, our, in our soul, in our spirit, even in our body, uh, amen, that we would glorify God, uh, uh, that we would be pleasing uh, unto Him as the heart painteth, painteth, uh, oh, when that deer has run, uh, uh, that, that deer, for whatever reason, uh, you know, one, in some, in one place it even talks about He maketh the hinds to calf. Uh, Oh, uh, how that the lightning, the clouds come and the thunder and, and causes uh, uh, the animals to run and brings on the distress of the body and brings about uh, 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 the pains of birth and uh, to, to bring about birth uh, and causes the hinds to calf. Uh, whatever uh, has caused that deer to run and to run to the point uh, that that deer has got so thirsty until it comes to that uh, place, uh, that brook that it can get water from. Uh, this is the comparison. So painteth my soul after thee, O God. You know, uh, we've got to be empty in order to be filled. Oh, yes. And so many times why we don't pant after the living God. My soul thirsteth for God, uh, for the living God. <laughs> Notice that, for the living God. Oh, here in this setting, in this environment, uh, there were so many uh, paving gods, so, so many uh, things uh, that the children of Israel uh, was in and around, uh, and many had followed after. Uh, but here, uh, he is letting it make, be made known uh, that there be no misunderstanding. My soul painted for the living God, not for the idols, not for the false gods, uh, this world, not for the things uh, that can only satisfy for a fleeting moment. There are pleasures for the flesh and sin for just a moment. Oh, uh, it's only for a very short period of time. Oh, but if our soul is thirsting for the living God, crying out for the living God, 
Oh, it will help us and enable us to walk and to be able to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And we won't be conformed to this world, but we'll be transformed. Amen. By the renewing of our mind. By the renewing of it. You see, brothers and sisters, uh, you've come this morning here under the sound of the gospel also to have your mind renewed. Oh, to have and to have your pure mind stirred up in way of remembrance of the things of the Lord. You know, there's so many great advantages under the preaching of the gospel. I'm afraid a lot of times primitive Baptists have made it sound like the you know, that uh, preaching about what the gospel don't do. And oh, that's right. Uh, there, there's, you know, we understand that. The gospel, there's no gospel regeneration. There's no use of the gospel uh, uh, in regeneration. For it's in the, the new birth and so forth and all. Oh, but I want to tell you, the gospel is everything to the disciple of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. The preaching, uh, hearing the gospel. Oh, it's so useful. Uh, the disciples of Christ, uh, amen, are sheep in a fold and they have an under-shepherd. Uh, amen, of course, Christ, uh, he, is, he is our chief shepherd. Uh, as the scripture says, when the chief shepherd shall appear. Thank God there is a chief shepherd. I'm not the chief shepherd. I'm an under-shepherd. Uh, amen, under him, uh, way under him. Uh, oh, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but in, a, in a congregation, a church setting, uh, uh, as the New Testament uh, uh, describes, and teaches and tells us uh, and, and the setting forth of God's word and that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Uh, and then the preaching of the gospel is profitable unto you. And then he went on and he talked about for reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. You know, I got to thinking about sheep a little bit this week and, and the shepherd and dealing with sheep and uh, being a, a pastor. And there are a lot of duties and responsibilities of a pastor. I'm, I'm afraid that uh, though the, the primary responsibility and duty has been shirked, has been laid aside and too much emphasis has been placed upon the social part of trying to, and I hope you understand where I'm coming from with that, uh, the social part of being a pastor rather than uh, the, the feeding. Amen. The primary responsibility of the keeper of sheep, amen, uh, of a shepherd is to flee, is to feed the flock, to watch over the flock. That's, that, is, that is my gravest uh, responsibility and duty. And in doing so, uh, with the gospel opening the scriptures, well, when the scripture uh, speaks of correction, I begin to think of it in this way. And I don't know if you've ever heard it like this or not before, but I kind of begin to think of it along this way for correction. You know, with animals, of, of any kind of animals, uh, you know, th there has to be pe periodical uh, at times along the way uh, when they are wormed. You know, uh, uh, that is a correction. They get parasites in them. And there has to be a worming uh, uh, with medication or supplements or whatever the usage is that is given to those animals uh, uh, to, to kill and, and for the body to expel uh, those parasites that the body uh, certainly does not need. I want to tell you this is what the preaching of the gospel will do for the sheep. It will correct the system. And then it will correct. It will help get rid. Uh, it will help kill parasites. Oh, that the, uh, that the sheep, that the disciples of Jesus Christ do not need. <laughs> Amen. Oh, we don't need those parasites that catch a, that catch a hold and inward and outward uh, and, uh, and, and draw and, and, uh, and, and to live and to feed off of and, and to weaken. That's what parasites do. They weaken uh, an animal. And I want to tell you the parasites of this world uh, they will weaken, amen, the disciples, uh, uh, the gospel foe. They will weaken it. Uh, uh, that's the correction, amen, that needs to take place. Then reproof, uh, the sheep, 
uh, need reproving from time to time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there has to be hoof care. Amen. For a lot of different kind of animals. Uh, there, there, there has to, uh, horses and sheep and cattle and different ones. Uh, they can get uh, uh, bruises. Uh, uh, they, they can uh, uh, get caught in places. Uh, there can be deformities uh, uh, of the hoofs that grow out wrong, that grow too long. There has to be the clipping uh, uh, of nails. Uh, uh, there has to be the reproof. Uh, uh, sheep uh, also from time to time, uh, uh, once a year in a natural sense, uh, need shearing. Uh, there's things uh, through reproof that we need to be sheared. Amen. Now, I'd say this. Sheep don't get sheared every Sunday. Amen. <laughs> and sheep get sheared once a year. <laughs> Amen. The main point is when God gives the mind to do so and the, and, and the emphasis from God's Word. Uh, but the point that I'm making is uh, that we shepherds need to be careful uh, about the shearing, about the reproving, uh, uh, that it be done in the way that would be pleasing to the Lord. But the Word of God, the preaching of the Gospel, uh, that is as uh, thirsty, that is uh, uh, even as thirsty uh, as water is to a thirsty soul, so is this good news from a far country. It is from a far country. Amen. It is from the Lord. It is from heaven. And it, even as Peter said, we preach with the Holy Ghost uh, sent down from heaven. I want to turn over to Isaiah chapter 12. And then, of course, in the preaching of the gospel is the instruction in righteousness. And God's children need a consistent and a constant diet of instruction in righteousness. But here in Isaiah chapter 12, this is a very short chapter. There's six verses, Isaiah chapter 12. And it starts out like this. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou was angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength. Amen. I like that there. Once again, the Lord Jehovah or our, our husband. <laughs> Amen. Our Lord, as Sarah called Abraham, Lord. Amen. And this is the way, remember, remember the lessons. When the Lord took Israel out of Egypt and led her by the hand as a husband unto her and was married unto her. Because he said that he had not before appeared uh, as he was going to appear now at this time. I trust some of you remember those lessons. And, uh, but nevertheless, so here the Lord, he is my salvation. He's my deliverer. And that's what our husband is unto us. And that's what a husband should be, a natural husband to a natural spouse. He should be as a deliverer unto her. Amen. Here in this life, a protector, a shielder. We could go on and on with that, but nevertheless, I believe you understand that. But this, behold, God is my salvation. He is our deliverer. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Manifest its deliverer. Oh, the manifestation of the delivering power of God. Therefore, with joy shall we Draw water out of the wells of salvation. <laughs> Thank God there is a well of salvation, a well of deliverance. I'm not talking about getting born again for heaven and mortal glory. I'm not talking about getting saved for heaven and mortal glory or the usage of the gospel in that sense. And, I'm, and it's not talking about it here in this sense, but for the disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, there are wells of salvation, uh, amen, to be drawn out of. Oh, yes, just like in the old sense, uh, uh, as the well was there and, and you took of whatever the, the container. Now, a lot of wells were cisterns. Uh, maybe they weren't that deep, uh, 
uh, but uh, uh, you know, just three or four or five foot deep, but, but wide, but they had been made cisterns out of. Uh, and uh, they were filled up with the water, the rain that rained. Uh, but they were along the way in places for people to, to get water out of. But, but the water had to be drawn, whatever, no, no matter how deep or how shallow, uh, the cistern or the well, there had to be a container to go down into the water uh, and to bring it up again. Uh, this is what, as disciples of Christ, uh, we are admonished uh, and in that day thou shalt say O Lord uh, I tell you uh, I believe uh, that uh, uh, this, this no doubt uh, has multiple applications uh, uh, and instances of, of times uh, times of Israel when God delivered uh, uh, but uh, uh, particularly uh, in a time uh, of the future of speaking uh, of when Christ come, had come uh, to this earth uh, and set up the gospel church here uh, and call forth uh, disciples uh, and it set forth wells uh, in Zion. Uh, oh, uh, uh, doctrinal wells, practical wells, disciplinary wells, uh, uh, whatever uh, the need. Uh, thank God. Uh, there are wonderful uh, teachings, uh, wonderful doctrinal truths to be drawn out of the wells of salvation. Amen. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to draw out of the well of salvation? Amen. The doctrine of election. Draw up a good drink of election. <laughs> Amen. Well, yeah. I want to I love the doctrine of election. Amen. Well, there's a lot of folks, you know, hate it. Want to rip it out. Want to tear it out of their Bible. Don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, they just don't understand it. Uh, no, they don't. Uh, I tell you, there wouldn't be one in heaven in immortal glory uh, if it wasn't. Uh, amen for election. Uh, oh, thank God. Uh, and thank God for the teaching of it. Uh, and the teaching that teaches us. Uh, and in Zion, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, we can drink. Uh, amen of that doctrine of election that God for uh, knew. Uh, 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 he for loved uh, uh, objects, uh, uh, individuals, people. Uh, out of uh, the, the human race that would be here upon this earth and in his mind and purpose uh, he saw them uh, uh, before uh, the world was ever created uh, before the foundation of the world he chose and treasured a people in Christ Jesus yeah. sure he did we could yeah. multiply text on that doctrine of election uh, the, God gave the reference and the, the pattern, uh, the lesson of Jacob and Esau, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Oh, election is a Bible doctrine. It's in the well of salvation, and the disciples of Christ need to, to draw that up and draw it out and take a good drink of it. Oh, that will encourage us. Oh, and that God, those very ones that he loved and elected, uh, that he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, uh, that he predestinated them unto the adoption of children. Yeah. Thank God for that. And those very ones that he called, and those ones that he called, uh, he justified. And those that he justified, amen, he will glorify. Amen. It, it says he glorified past tense. Uh, it's just as good as done, brothers and sisters. Uh, wisdom hath built in her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Uh, amen. There are pillars. Uh, uh, foundational gospel. Uh, uh, cardinal truths of doctrine. Uh, and I believe that those five that I just mentioned to you uh, uh, and, and election uh, uh, and the resurrection uh, and then that would be seven really good pillars. Uh, amen. Uh, that the house of God God is built upon and established upon Christ himself being the chief uh, cornerstone. But there are wells of salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. With joy we draw out this water. With joy we approach unto the Lord. With joy we press ourselves upon him. The scripture teaches us that the law and the prophets were until John but now it's the gospel of the kingdom preached. And every man presseth into it. 
pressing against the flesh, the world, and the devil. As I said, we get thirsty doing that for we're engaged in a spiritual battle. We're engaged in a spiritual warfare. And so we must continuously, with joy, to draw water out of the wells of salvation. I turn to Isaiah chapter 55 and in verse 1, when the scripture says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Who does he say to come to the waters? Amen. The ones that thirst. That's the qualified. Amen. If you thirst, come to the water. Amen. You don't come to the water to get thirsty. Hello. Amen. You don't come to the water to get thirsty. You come to the water because you are thirsty. So there's the qualifier. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth. E-T-H. In a state of thirst. I tell you, only born again children of God can be in a state of thirst. <laughs> Amen. They're talking about the, in a spiritual sense. And thirsting for the things of God. Thirsting for that water that only the Lord can give. Uh, ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without honey and without price. There it is in the same context as we talked about the church uh, uh, there at Laodicea. Uh, if you are uh, thirsty, uh, you don't have to have the things of this life. Uh, and, and, and he's saying, uh, uh, I don't want uh, uh, your natural things uh, uh, in this context here. Uh, uh, what you're to do is to come because you're thirsting and cast yourself uh, upon me and fall down even as those 300 fell down at the water under Gideon uh, and laughed it up like a dog. Uh, amen. Uh, that's the ones uh, uh, that the Lord uh, told Gideon to take and to use in the battle. And of course there's another thing there about putting those lamps in those uh, uh, pictures. They concealed the light. But then when the time came they were to break the picture so that the light would shine. All well, the scripture teaches us uh, to so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, amen. The scriptures uh, teach us over and over concerning good works. And, and one text even says uh, uh, for us to be careful to maintain good works. Uh, amen. And of course, that doesn't come before. Those good works come after. Uh, after the created. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works uh, uh, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. There are those things that are designated and ordained as good works that the, that the disciples of Jesus Christ should engage in and should seek after and should promote in our lives. Oh, to the honor and to the very glory of our blessed Lord. In Isaiah chapter 44, there in verse 3 and verse 4, he said, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a wonderful promise? I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. He didn't say anything about pouring water on anybody that wasn't thirsty. Oh, but here it is again, the qualifier. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. What did Jesus say? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's a promise. There's a promise. Amen. That if we are truly thirsting after right things. <laughs> Amen. That's thirsting after the Lord. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. If we're risen with Him, amen, then we should seek after the things uh, which are above, uh, heavenly things, uh, uh, whereby uh, that we would be earthly good. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Oh, thank God uh, for His promise to His people that will obey Him and serve Him and thirst after Him. Uh, uh, thirst after the living God, even as the heart of the deer thirsteth at the brook. Oh, to thirst after the living God. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. 
Oh yes, here this water has, it's in reference, uh, amen, to the Spirit. Amen. We've got to have uh, that water. We've got to, to have that manifestation of the Spirit of God. Why the Scripture teaches us that as many as are led by the Spirit, they are, amen, the sons of God. If we're led by the Spirit, it's, it's uh, evidence that we are children of God. Uh, only God's children uh, uh, can be led by His Spirit. Uh, and then He tells His uh, uh, disciples as He writes the letters uh, uh, to the different churches in the New Testament. But He says for us to walk in the Spirit. He teaches us to live in the Spirit. Uh, oh, uh, and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, uh, this is only, uh, amen, by having the water, uh, drinking the water. Uh, oh, uh, uh, quenching our thirst while we live right here in this dry and thirsty land all the, 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 the natural it has no supply we know it's hard and harsh we know Baca's veil is dry and it yields no supply amen but thank God we can dig a well <laughs> amen Oh, there can be a well in the autumn rains can feel the cistern. Oh, whereby uh, that we can drink. Even in the Vale of Baca, uh, there can be a watering. Uh, there can be a refreshing for the pilgrim uh, on his journey home uh, as we're traveling here through this low ground of sin and sorrow and suffering. Uh, oh, we get so thirsty. We get parched. We get dry. Oh, uh, we feel uh, uh, the uh, encumberment uh, of this old world in this antichrist world system but thank God for the Bethel spot that we have to come to and to sing and pray and sit under the sound of the gospel and have a refreshing of that latter rain oh, that refreshes our very being that encourages us and strengthens us whereby we can keep pressing on as we're journeying here thank God forevermore Jesus, remember that Jesus said that if you keep these sayings of mine and do these sayings of mine, and that'd be like a man that built his house upon the rock. Yeah. And the rains come and the winds blew, but it didn't fall. Oh, and if you do my word, keep my word, then are you my disciples indeed. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Amen. I believe this, this has reference uh, uh, just as Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Uh, uh, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, saith God, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters uh, shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and upon my servants and handmaids uh, in those days will I pour out of my spirit. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, this is that yeah. which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Amen. Thank God, I tell you, uh, Zion is a watered place. When the Lord, amen, is the Lord of the place. Amen. When he, when, when he uh, manifests his smiling face, when his spirit, amen, comes down into us, Oh, and hovers, and we're lifted up and made to sit in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. We're made to sit in that heavenly place. We can't get there on our own. You can't, uh, uh, in that sense, uh, you can't command of uh, the Spirit. You can't uh, uh, admonish the Spirit. You know, I know there's religious, quote-unquote religious folks that thinks that they can and, and so forth. Uh, uh, but I remember the words of Jesus. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeneth, in other words, where it pleaseth, and thou hearest the sound, and, and cannot tell whither it cometh and whither it goeth. So as everyone that is born of the Spirit of God, amen, that's showing the sovereignty of the Spirit of God, amen, that He blows upon whom He will, when He will. <laughs> and of course, the context of that is regeneration. But it, it uh, amen, we, we understand though, uh, just that very principle that we do not demand. We do not command the Spirit. <laughs> Amen. It is the Lord uh, that blesses. It is the Lord that gives. It is the Lord that manifests. It is the Lord that shows forth. And in verse 4 it says, And they shall spring up as among the grass 
as willows by the water courses. <laughs> oh, by the, the willows by the water courses. In other words, by the streams. By the, by the places where there's water, where there's streams of water and the willows grow. Remember it was the children of Israel down in Babylon. They were down by the river and said they required of us a song. He said, we wept when we remembered Zion. And oh, they said they hang their harps upon a willow tree. There's willows growing there by the water. <laughs> oh, they hung their harps on the willow tree and said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Oh, but brothers and sisters, he said, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water concourses, by the courses of water, by the streams of water, to be as the willows that grow and flourish. So would the children of God be the disciples of the Lord. Amen. Watered by the Lord. Oh, how sweet and wonderful that is. I want to turn over there to, to John chapter 7. That's very important. The context of this is the Feast of Tabernacles. And you understand that from verse 2. Because it says now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And I invite you, I'm not going to take the time to do so, the sake of time, but if you go back to Leviticus chapter 23, you can read about uh, uh, some things concerning there, the Feast of Tabernacles. There was five major feasts, uh, Passover, uh, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, uh, these different ones of uh, holy convocations that the Lord established and set up. And of this uh, Feast of Tabernacles, it was to, to go forth for seven days, and then on the eighth day was a holy convocation. And there was no several work to be done. There was no harsh or hard work or slave labor-like work. The only thing that they could do would be a very necessity for its preparation of food. Uh, in that sense, to dress food and to, to eat, to, to have something to eat. Then talk about the old, you know, go out and hoe in the garden and stuff like that for us to have something to eat. It talked about the, act, it's the actual preparation of it. In other words, it made it pretty plain there would be no several work. It's a holy convocation on that eighth day. And in that setting of that eighth day of this Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus was there in attendance. And in verse 37, it says, in the last day, talking about that last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, what did Jesus do? It's called here in that last day, that great day of the Feast. That's why it's called that great day of the Feast, because it was one of the most important days. That eighth day, that holy convocation. And in this Feast of Tabernacles, particularly, was the drawing and pouring out of water. But Jesus stood and cried. You know, a lot of expressions you'll find where Jesus taught uh, and so forth that he, that he sit. Now, it'll say that he spoke loud. Uh, you'll have that reference. But here it says Jesus stood and cried. Boy, shows, that shows importance right here. It, it shows out not to miss the mark. I tell you, it, Jesus was fervent. Oh, that this message would be proclaimed and to go out. Jesus stood. Yeah. Jesus stood up Amen. and cried out. Now what did he say? If any man thirst, yeah. let him come unto me and drink. There's the qualifier once again. Every time the scripture qualifies, Jesus says, if any man thirst. We don't have any trouble as old Baptists uh, with the expressions if any man or whosoever will or any of those type words uh, uh, and so forth that, that men play upon so trying to prove their false doctrine, trying to wrangle and wrangle and pervert and twist uh, the word of God to fit what they're trying to teach. No. If any man thirsts, it means any man, Jew or Gentile, anybody, any man, woman, and, and, and male or female. But it has a qualifier. The qualifier is thirst. Right. I tell you, if, if you're thirsting, you've done got a living person. That's right. 
You got a living person. Jesus wouldn't call in anyone dead in trespass and sin to come get a drink of water. No. No. That wasn't the point. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come. <laughs> let him come. Let him get up and do something. Get up and move. Amen. The disciples of Jesus Christ were to move. We're to move about. We're to be engaged. We're to be exercising in the kingdom work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be engaging. We're to be moving. We're to be coming. Amen. This is in discipleship. And this come to me right here. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And this come, this coming here is not in the same context as, as John chapter uh, 6, verse 37. It's not in the same context. That, that coming over there is in regeneration where Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. What's the qualifier there that for, for him to come? It, that the Father gave him to him. Right. And it's a passive coming. It's a drawing. Jesus, he settled that there in John uh, 6 and uh, talking about the, the drawing uh, power of God that, and, and, the, and that the Father would, would draw uh, there in John chapter 6. And the reason I couldn't find it was because a page stuck together and uh, turned me over to John chapter 5. But in John chapter uh, 6 and 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So when, when Jesus says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, as those that the Father gave him, it is a passive coming. It is not a gospel invitation. This is a gospel invitation here in John 6, 37. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Yeah. This is a gospel invitation. John 6, 37 is not a gospel invitation. Right. Now you children remember that. You parents teach it to them. Right. It's important. Amen. About 25 years ago, there were some, some elders in, in different parts of the country that rose up and started trying to place John 6, 37 not as a, uh, a gospel, as a regenerational coming, uh, not a passive coming, but put it in the context of a gospel coming. And that just, that wasn't the way it was. And, that, and it, it, it led to other problems. And uh, that will lead to other problems. But here in John 7 and 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, because Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Uh, here you've already got a live person. Here you've already got one that's alive. They're not dead in trespass and sin. Uh, they're, they're hearing the message. And if they are thirsting, Jesus says, Let him come unto me and drink. Now, Another reason why I know that those two passages I just went over are different. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Yeah. That's, that's without exception. That's nice. Every one of the elect are going to come in regeneration at the call of the life-giving voice of the Son of God. And, they're go and it's going to be passive. It's go the Father's going to be drawn just like Lazarus was passive, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus did not arise and come forth by his own power. He came forth passively. Jesus was active. His life-giving voice was active. But here, it doesn't tell us anything about all that's going to come. I want to tell you, many of God's elect do not come in this coming right here. Are you with me? Many of the elect, they don't come in this John 7, 37. Many are not the disciples the way that they ought to be and, and, and some are barely on the scale as far as discipleship. I hope, I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. But if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. This is the emphasis. 
Come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said. Here the scripture's involved. Here the message is involved. Here the preaching of the gospel is involved. I tell you, the preaching of the gospel is very, very important. God has ordained preaching. You've heard me say that before. God has ordained preaching for His disciples. The gospel saves the saved. Amen. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Here's Jesus teaching a lesson of the pouring out of the Spirit. And it is prophetic of, the, of Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost would be poured out upon the disciples of Jesus Christ. And empower them for service. And then the Apostle Peter, he said in Acts chapter 5, I believe it was, that the Holy Ghost is given to them that old bay. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. The Holy Ghost was not yet given in the sense that Jesus is speaking of. He had not come in his office. The, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ. Christ was with them, but the Comforter, he was not going to leave them comfortless. He was not going to leave them as orphans. He was not going to leave them without. But thank God He was going to come back unto them. And He came back unto them in power of the, and in the, of the Holy Ghost. And said, after that you receive the Holy Ghost, you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost part of the world. Yeah. He empowered for service. Now they had a great measurement of that power for service. You've heard me talk about that before. Amen. But we are not without power. We are not without ability. Amen. We, we have discernment. We have wisdom. We have knowledge. We have these things through the Spirit. They had it in great measure. Christ had it without measure. They had it with measure, but they had a great measure. We have a lesser measure. But we have the infallible Word of God. Amen. Relying upon whereby, amen, that, that, that is the source and where, whereby that we can use uh, in, for knowledge and, and help uh, of wisdom uh, and that the Lord would bless us with His Spirit to appropriate and to use uh, the knowledge and the wisdom of His Word. Uh, amen. To carry on in the kingdom service of God and how that we ought to conduct ourselves in the, in the house of the Lord, which is the church. Amen of the living God, which is the ground, the pillar of truth. These things, as the Apostle Paul told Timothy to teach and exhort and remember that text as Paul longed to go to the Romans. And the very end purpose of it was for this reason, that he might impart unto them some spiritual gift. That they might be, to this end, that they might be established. Right. Remember that was last Sunday. Rooted and grounded and settled in these wonderful things. In these wonderful truths of God's Word. That Christ gave and the Apostle and the first century church and Timothy and Titus. And right on down the line, and, and, and faithful men that would teach others, and them others becoming faithful men, and them to teach others, and they to become faithful men and to teach others. And come right on down the line, the teaching and the preaching of the gospel. Uh, even now, to this point in this day and time, oh, uh, uh, that we're in. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Brothers and sisters, somewhere, somehow, when Jesus comes again in the end of time, there will be a body of people uh, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth uh, and believing these precious truths as it is in Christ Jesus. I believe that, and if I uh, didn't believe that, I wouldn't be uh, here today. But I believe that. Amen. I believe that. God bless you this morning. We've just scratched the surface. 
of these things, but I pray that it whet, whet your appetite and you would uh, search these things out and see if they be so. Be like the Bereans. Uh, God bless you is my prayer. We'll select a song. We'll stand together.